Hello and welcome to this BDA podcast focusing on iodine and fortification. My guest today will help us to explore the role of iodine in the diet, why it's important, along with some of the challenges and the debate that it presents. I'm pleased to welcome Julie Abiomi, Chair of the BDA England Board and Research Officer for the BDA Maternal and Fertility Nutrition Specialist Group, Heather Russell, a dietitian at the Vegan Society, and Kate Halliwell, Chief Scientific Officer at the Food and Drink Federation. You can find more information and links on the comments section of this podcast or by visiting us at www.bda.uk.com. And we're going to start this roundtable discussion with Julie. Julie, let's start with why iodine is important. Iodine is a really um, important nutrient in the diet. It's essential for thyroid hormone production for everybody. It's particularly important during pregnancy because it's needed for fetal brain and neurological development in the womb. So one of the concerns is that if women are not getting enough iodine in their diet during pregnancy, it could have a detrimental effect on brain development in their unborn child. And there are studies that show that even a mild deficiency of iodine during pregnancy can have an effect on the IQ of children later in life. Kate, let's bring you in at this point for, uh, I, I suppose, a sense of the kind of perspective from industry, because I think companies and industry need some certainty around iodine. I think there's an agreement, perhaps it's a good thing, but it's just about how it fits with the wider fortification challenge. Yes, I think that's right, James. So from a company perspective, of course, we do have a lot of fortified foods, most of which are voluntary, terribly fortified. And if you were sort of sitting there as a company nutritionist thinking, OK, you know, I'm really looking at my product. I'm looking at product innovation. Uh, is it a good time to, to look at the fortificants we use or should we start using some? Um, I think there has to be sort of two issues that you would look at and that you would need clarity on. So one would be an understanding of the public health need, which, of course, sounds straightforward. And, and for people listening to this who are probably registered dietitians will be really obvious. But actually, it might not be obvious if, as a company nutritionist, your focus has probably been mainly on macronutrients in your product, maybe vitamin D um, or calcium, or, you know, what we might think of as sort of almost really obvious requirements. So you'd have to really kind of understand there was that need. And, you know, given where we are with SACEN statements and the, the, the NDNS data, I, I don't think that is maybe as clear as it could be. And, and linked to that, there's got to be a sort of demand from the public. Because again, if you're thinking as a company about your product, and, and you're thinking about your customer, what's someone going to think when they pick that product up? Are they looking for iodine fortification? And I would suggest at the moment, most people probably aren't, because there hasn't been a big awareness driving campaign yet. And so what that would mean is someone might pick it up and think, oh, why, you know, why is that there? Why have I got iodine? Why is the company adding that into my product? Do I really want it? So I think the absolute critical thing from our perspective would be that real clarity of message so that companies understand that it's important for them to consider whether it is uh, something they should be looking to put into their product and also customers understand why it's there if it is put in. Okay, Heather, let's pick up some of those bits and bring you in at this point because there's an element of this debate, I think, which is about you know helping people to I suppose, no more, but also optimise their intake of something like iodine. And in some ways, I think a vegan perspective has sort of pushed this debate forward. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, I think it's it's really interesting to think about that, that company perspective from Kate. But yeah, also we have a lot of people in Britain who are who are choosing a vegan diet. Um, also a lot of general interest in, in vegan alternatives. For example, the grocer conducted a survey last year and found that most adults had purchased plant-based alternatives to milk. So, um, you know, potentially there are, are a few different groups within the, within the population who would be interested in this topic if, if they were aware of the importance of iodine and also how that can be obtained from, from a vegan diet or vegan alternatives. So, you know, from a, a vegan perspective, you know, you're looking for sources of nutrition that can replace animal products in the diet to help ensure that you maintain your intake of essential nutrients like iodine. For example, um, if someone's choosing a vegan diet, reliable sources of iodine would include potentially a supplement that contains 
potassium iodide or potassium iodate, or if someone's got a good intake of a plant-based alternative to milk, say 500 ml, which is about half a carton, they could look for a, a product that's well fortified with iodine um, and then use that product to, to help them meet their, their iodine requirement. Um, so I think that I think that the point that that Kate raises is, is really key. Um, you know, we we think at the the vegan society that iodine deserves a bit more airtime. People seem to spend a lot of time searching for um, information about vitamin B12, for example. But you know, iodine is really important too. So I think that you know we can do a lot to help raise awareness um, of this this nutrient um, so that people understand how they can obtain it and simple and and practical solutions really to help them get the nutrition that they need and and optimize their diets. Julie you started at the beginning of the podcast talking about uh, why it's important for particular groups and I think some of this debate uh, people often think well actually you know it it should be about the diet in the round because it's not exclusively it's it's not just about people who consume plant-based alternatives exclusively is it? it it's part of a wider question I think you know iodine is essential for for everybody so whether you're a vegan or not a vegan or whether you're choosing more plant-based foods in in your diet everybody needs iodine regularly in their diet I was very interested that um, Kate picked up on the issue of consumer demand and that we're more likely to see fortified products if consumers were were demanding that in my role as um i'm involved in nutrition education i find that very few people have even heard of iodine or know that it's an essential nutrient in the diet they may have they may have heard of calcium they may have heard of iron these are much more kind of common nutrients that the general public might know about so if they are picking up um, a a carton of plant-based milk you know they might be looking to see is it fortified with calcium is it fortified with b12 but they're not necessarily going to be looking for the iodine because they might not even know what iodine is or why it's needed in the diet so i think part of this is that you know we do need to raise awareness of iodine and that it it is an important nutrient it is essential in the diet and people should be looking for iodine fortification on labels just as much as they are looking for calcium and b12 fortification okay let's bring you in on some of those points particularly the one around demand and that that link to people's general awareness of, of iodine it's it's not something that i hear discussed a lot and i think that consumer demand as, as i was alluded to earlier i think you know from a company perspective clearly that's quite a big driver you know if you think about why you're putting something into a product or how you make a product uh, you want it obviously you want it to taste nice you want it to have the right texture all of those sorts of things uh which of course is your macronutrient composition Whereas when we're looking at fortification, generally speaking, you know, that that's not the reason that's going in. You're, you're very much putting it in for a, a public health reason and because consumers are starting to look for it generally and demand it. And that, you know, that helps a company to understand why they might need to do it. And also from a, a business perspective, I guess a bottom line perspective, you've got to think, well, if you're going to start to fortify the kind of decision process of is it is it the right thing to do? Is it helpful for that population? that I'm serving so you know I guess in this discussion a classic example would be maybe the plant milks given currently we get um, quite a lot of our iodine from dairy products so you know that's the sort of starting point for the consideration you've then also then got to think okay technically how would I do that what am I adding in what does that mean to my labeling is it going to have a different impact is it going to slightly change the color for example now i'm making these up i have no idea i have to say what potassium iodate would do to a product uh, but you know you would have to go through that process is there a level you want to put it in at such that it doesn't impact the flavor uh, you know so there's all those things that you would be considering which will add cost and add resource time to get that product right so you would want to be clear that at the end of that process there is you know, as an absolute minimum, that it's not going to have a negative impact on your product, uh, which given the addition to labelling, it potentially could have, or, you know, obviously, ideally, that it is a positive. So it's both a positive to public health, but it is a positive for your product, such that you're going to see some benefit for that initial investment that you're going to have to put in. So Heather, let's bring you in on that point in terms of, in in terms of the benefit, because that links, I think, to, I suppose, how people 
know about or can navigate that kind of relevant knowledge in, in terms of some of the nutritional information and some of the labeling. And that I think that's particularly important, isn't it, from from your point of view in, in terms of the, the work you do with the vegan society? Yeah, that's that's definitely um, a really important part of our work. So if you go into um, a large supermarket, there's a completely baffling array of um, plant-based alternatives to, to milk these days and a lot of variation in the range of nutrients they contain and also the amounts as well. Um, so when we're sort of thinking about consumers and, and how we can help them to make choices that fit well with their with their diets and help them to get enough of all the essential nutrients, it's commonly accepted um, that it's a good idea to fortify plant-based alternatives to milk with a similar amount of calcium to cow's milk. But I think that the iodine fortification isn't something that's been sort of widely adopted at this point, although there have been a lot of products um, that have been reformulated or launched over the last few years that contain iodine. And that's helpful for people who are uh, making the transition from a diet that contains animal products to a vegan diet so it helps them to to maintain their their intake of iodine so i think that there's a lot that the bda and its its members can do to help people who choose vegan diets and people who choose vegan alternatives um, and to help people to you know to optimize their nutrition and um, so for example helping people with food labels so helping people to sort of understand the nutrients that can be found on a food label understand the sort of amounts of nutrients that are found in different products and sort of you know simple ways of kind of looking for nutrients that are particularly um, valuable and the kind of amounts that are that are valuable for people as well so that they can navigate all these products and hopefully make you know make good choices so I think that there's a lot that that we can do and, and certainly you know people who eat a vegan diet they do appreciate vegan specific information and um, so there are resources on the vegan society's website for example um, that you can share to help people to to understand the importance of this topic um, and, and you know what they might look out for um, when they're trying to um, you know make decisions about the products that they're purchasing. Can I just come in on that as well James because I think Heather raised an interesting point about amounts and I think again from a company perspective understanding the amount that it, you know if you did decide to fortify would be appropriate and maybe having some help around that so whether that's through the BDA or through government advice or, or you know coming to talk to the vegan society you know we have to legally if we were adding iodine it would have to be at a minimum of 15% for the label um, purposes but that you know that isn't necessarily make doesn't make it the right amount and if you look at calcium fortification generally plant-based milks would fortify at the level that you would expect to get calcium from milk now my understanding with iodine is that that varies quite a lot across depending on the milk type you get and the, the production of the milk so it could be really useful I think if there was some work that was around modeling what would be an appropriate amount what would really make a difference into people's diets so that companies have a, a not, you know almost a target in mind if you like but an idea of what it is they should be trying to work to and to see if that kind of level is um, achievable once you start to then work through things like is there a flavor taint is there a color taint that I mentioned before. Julie let's bring you on in on that point because um, from I guess from the BDA's perspective uh, there are perhaps things we could consider in relation to that sort of clarity question and that um, that that need for certainty in, in, amongst some of our industry partners. Absolutely, and I'm so glad that Kate and Heather have both raised this issue because I think for consumers it's very confusing. If you look at the brands that are on the market at the moment, some of them are fortified with iodine and some of them aren't. Even the same brand, there might be particular products within that brand that are fortified, but then other brands aren't. And even the difference between whether it's a product that's in the fridge or if it's a UHT product some of them might be fortified and some of them aren't so it's quite confusing for consumers and Kate is absolutely right that there's a, a wide variation in the amount of iodine that is fortified in these products so if we look at the amount that's available from cow's milk it ranges from 25 to 50 micrograms per 100 mils some of the difference depends on the, the feed that the cattle have which can influence the amount of iodine in the milk it also varies on whether the milk is organic or not. So organic cow's milk has a lower amount of iodine than 
non-organic cow's milk. So that's another thing that introduces some variety. But I think if we want this to be a useful amount of fortification for consumers, it needs to be a similar amount that we are finding in cow's milk. So, I mean, some of the products that on the market that are labelled as fortified with iodine, the amount of iodine is so small that consumers would need to drink maybe over a litre of that product a day to get what's recommended for for a daily intake of iodine. So there's the, the huge amount of variation in both in products, but also in the amount of fortification is causing a lot of confusion for consumers. Heather, I think it's true that although, uh, you know, there are a growing number of people who are exclusively vegan, there are a number of us who would adopt, I guess, a more flexible, a kind of flexitarian diet, if you want to to call it that. So uh, there's a range of different factors here. It's affecting lots of different people in in different ways, I think. Yeah, it's certainly not just a a vegan issue and you know it depends on uh, sort of groups within the the population in terms of stage of life as Julie mentioned earlier you know pregnancy is a time where we really need to pay extra special attention to iodine and then there's also such huge variation in in the diets that people that people choose so obviously we know there's a lot of general interest in plant-based alternatives to milk and there's quite a bit of variation in terms of interest um, in different groups of the population so in my mind it would be helpful if we could ensure that anyone who chooses one of these alternative products you know for whatever reason isn't sort of missing out on on the the iodine um, element and in terms of the amounts I think that I agree with Julie we do need to be mindful of the amount of iodine that's found in cow's milk obviously and um, there is some variation but you know perhaps trying to aim for around 25 micrograms per 100 mil um, you know that would be handy that would mean that if you consumed um, about half a carton which is about 500 mil of these fortified products on a daily basis that you'd be getting 80 to 90 percent of of the recommended iodine intake just from that that particular product and obviously pump foods do contain iodine it's just that um, they're likely to contain you know relatively relatively low amounts so you do need to make sure that you have a reliable source of iodine in your diet and I think that's particularly relevant to sort of all groups of the population who don't consume dairy foods you know whether that's um, that they they can't consume dairy foods or, or you know they choose not to. Well, that's all we have time for now. My thanks to our panel, Julie, Kate and Heather. For more information on this topic and on Dietitians Week 2021, you can visit www.bda.uk.com. 